Yes, sir. And I'll play a little bit about myself and the heroine and I have worked with franchises. Um, I've been a resident of the Woodlands for 46 years and a resident on Road 6 for 46 years. Uh, I uh, retired from Memorial Herman the Woodlands Hospital uh, after 20 years, serving as a vice president of addiction services and chief nursing officer. I have been on the GMBA board since 1997 except for a six-year hiatus when I served on the uh, WCA board and the Woodlands Fire Department. Uh, I currently uh, am continuing to serve on the GMBA board, and I also serve on the Aging in Place, the Woodlands Board, and the Woodlands Farm and Market Committee. Uh, Bruce Cunningham encouraged me years ago to run for this board, but my children were having grandbabies, so I didn't think I could give my full attention to something like this, but times have changed. So, in summary, if I'm a welfare, I would be honored to serve all of you on this board to continue to provide safe drinking water, uh, quality drinking water uh, at a reasonable price, and also preserving our valuable resources. Resource. Thank you, Pat. Any other public comments? Any director's comments? If I may. Of course. Uh, just to bring uh, to the notice of the board that the EPA has come out with a pre-publication notice on uh, final rule asbestos part one, chrysotile asbestos and regulation thereof. And it is actually the prohibition of future use of uh, such material. Uh, asbestos had a very long history in the US, the regulation thereof. and. Uh, included in the use of asbestos is uh, cement products which we're all familiar with asbestos cement specifically asbestos cement pipe and fittings and so there's going to be a part two of the rule coming out in december of 2024 that people should be aware of uh, in the discussions with regard to uh, removal of uh, ac pipe uh, in in the in our area that's great. Thank you. You get all that at the EPA website. Anybody else? Just a quick question. In, in Monday's, um, this past Monday's Grogan's Mill Village Association uh, meeting, there was a few inquiries from uh, directors and residents regarding um, the sewer break on Crossline Circle and specifically just some some details on what that, it sounds like it impacted a number of residents in that, that 2600 block of Crossline. Some backups in, in the residences. Uh, sewer backups on Crossline. Sewer backups on Crossline was caused by uh, Texas Pride contractor working over there. They set a plug in a manhole on Crossline and backed up some people 2703, 2705, and 2707. They have taken 100% responsibility for that backup and their cleanup crew and their insurance company is working with all three of those residents to correct the problem. Excellent. Thank you. Else. Any uh, adjustments? No adjustments. No adjustments. Right. <clears throat> Board members, um, how do you feel about the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda as as we have on our uh, packet. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> The next agenda item is to discuss the appointment of a new director to fill the vacant position previously held by Bruce Cunningham on the board and authorize any action necessary in connection therewith. So I mean, let me just say that our elections are in May. This is yeah. I March. thought this was going to be deferred because yeah. of the May election. I just think it mm -hmm. we should it shouldn't do anything. Are there competitive elections? Mm -hmm. That was the recommendation in February's meetings here, right? I thought too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because his seat was open already. <laughs> Hey, I intend to receive the regular monthly FJR Woodlands Division report, including any updates on operations, projects, and public outreach. You don't have anything to add to the report that's in your kit, but if you have any questions, I'll be answering them. Yep. <laughs> really certain you might have a question or two. Well, uh, really, it probably uh, it might belong a little bit later when we talk about the uh, trustee 
Okay. 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 All right. Then item 11, um, we have a, a Google, uh, we have a presentation from the SGRA Woodlands Division 10 year project plan presentation. As you all who don't know me, I'm Aaron Schindel with the Sandstone uh, River Authority Technical Services Department. I'm a project manager and engineer, and I'm going to be presenting the updated 10 year project plan for the Woodlands Division. A lot of people would call it CIP. Um, you've got the binders in front of you that contain the whole 10 year plan um, with sheets with a lot of detail on those projects, um, as well as you know, representative photos and maps and budgets and schedules, all those type of things. I've handed out the uh, presentation on the end. Mike, if you would, you can turn the light off. There we go. Like I said, we've been doing a 10 year project plan like it says CIP for years, and every year we go back through it and we update it as necessary to at projects that are, you know, we're continuing out another year and taking projects off that have been completed. And for this presentation, what I'll be doing is giving an overview of primarily projects that have already started and are continuing into FY25 or ones that'll be starting in FY25. Uh, along with the present those in the presentation, however, I'll be giving a little brief overview of the Woodland system, uh, expected levels of service, uh, how projects are developed, then go into those projects, and then a full wrap up of the budgetary items. With that, uh, first of all, just to overview the Woodlands system, I think a lot of you all have seen this before, years past, but to reminder, the Woodlands Division contains over 8,000 assets in a system. Uh, these are larger components of the system, whether they be pumps, blowers, motors, tanks, buildings, lines, manholes, valves, things of those nature. That does not include all the small parts and pieces that go along with those assets. So. Um, over 8,000 there, it could be the tens of thousands when you look at everything that goes along with it. But approximately our placement value for all those assets is, we say approximately $2 billion. Looking at inflation over the past few years and our estimates from when that occurred is probably well in excess of now $2 billion to replace all those assets. Uh, in the past, and we expect in the future and in the present, the level of service that the Woodlands residents expect is a high level of service. They want it out of sight, out of mind. You know, the water turns up when you turn the faucet on, the water comes out. It's clean, it's clear, it tastes good. When you flush the toilet, when you take a shower, bath, and you turn the drains out, you want it to go away, not have to even worry about it. Um, if we have a service disruption, which doesn't happen very often, we make sure that that is at the least amount of time possible. And we had only have one boil water nose in the past 50 years. It wasn't even a true violation because the, the, the sample side, it was on the resident side and not even in the system, though we had to report it. So how are projects determined like you see in that big binder you have in front of you? So first of all, look at all those assets. We have a comprehensive asset management plan. That's the criteria of how we set criticality of assets and then how we accumulate those critical assets and make projects. So we take into account things such as risk of failure, age condition, repair history. We have a software that tracks all that history and repair costs, um, the data from staff inspections and other study results, which I'll get into a little bit more here in a second. Also, if you have upcoming regulatory changes, you know, probably by TCQ or maybe even EPA, that could cause a project to have to happen. So going to the studies that we talked about in master plans, this is just a sample over the past few years of some master plans and studies that we have had performed by consultants to identify what I'd say is roughly 95% of the projects you see in the project plan. One's from going left to right, going with the wastewater system and the new water, what we call water reclamation facility or wastewater plant one, water well rehabilitation projects, um, AC water line replacements and other water system assets gravity sewer line rehab projects, and then plant two projects as well, because that's going to continue into the future using plant two and their maintenance projects that need to occur at that plant. <clears throat> the big key focus areas of the project plan, big 
you know, ticket items are the water line evaluation project and the renewal projects that will come out of that. Elev new elevate storage tank in the northwest side of the woodlands, the new water reclamation facility, aka wastewater plant number one, and optimization of the collection system that is going to that new water reclamation facility. So going into those projects like I talked about that are either ongoing and going to continue in the 25 or will be starting in 2025. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the AC water line condition base assessment project. This is that study where the funds were approved, utilizing the excess funds last week at the trustees meeting. But this takes a deep dive into assessing the criticality and the likelihood of failure of those AC water lines um, based upon you know, data analysis from records that we have on hand, drawings, um, geotechnical reports, and then break history. Also doing in-field testing, whether that be taking samples out of the pipes and testing in the laboratory, or putting in devices into the pipe that can study how, what kind of condition they're in. Looking also at socioeconomic impacts, and if you have a line break, what does that cause in the community? What kind of impact, you know, monetarily wise to businesses and residents does that cause? So we'll take all that information and the consultant we've hired, We'll wrap it up into recommendations on a prioritization of water line replacement projects for these AC lines with associated schedules and costs. Um, this project's $1.6 million to do, and we're anticipating being completed July of 2025. This map is showing all the AC water lines in the Woodland system. There's quite a few of them. Next project, and this one was in previous project plan and has been underway, is to replace the um, collection system lift stations in this area, all five of them that you see on the map, and their associated force planes with a single larger trunk gravity line. In doing so, you're taking out service, very old lift stations that have a lot of operation maintenance costs. In about 35, over a 35 year in the period, a study has shown that we'd have to spend another $30 million just to keep them going. Um, and by Doing this, you also take them out of the neighborhood, you're getting rid of them. Uh, you don't have to worry about odor and noise complaints that those lift stations could cause. So you're taking a, a large amount of operation maintenance at a different facilities, putting in the gravity line, which has hardly any operation maintenance. Elevated storage tank number six. This is a new EST elevated storage tank on the northwest side of the wilderness, like I mentioned before. We are in our temporary variance. Uh, from several years ago, that's about to expire in 2027. We'll have the new tank built by then. Um, but we have a lack of elevated storage capacity based upon TCQ requirements. So this new elevated storage tank is built to address that. And uh, all the uh, you know additional capacity needed for the sit what's reflected in the sixth and final accounting. Also gives you flexibility uh, you know, to take other tanks out of service and not have to be concerned as much when you have fire flows that you may need or high demand periods. If you have another tank out of service and you won't have to worry so much about lack of pressure and storage. South Shore Gravity Main Rehabilitation also been in the project plan before approved um, in a final design phase. This is just upstream of that optimization area, um, but you can see what kind of condition that ductile iron gravity line is in in those certain areas. So this project is to rehab that line, put it back in a you know, nice condition that uh, meets modern requirements. That's uh, about 6,700 linear feet of 42 inch and 36 inch ductile iron pipes in that area just south of the lake into the east and west. Wastewater plant number two, for facility number two, tertiary filter improvements. At plant two, there are three filters as part of the process of treatment and one filter has already been converted to a sand filtration system into a cloth media filtration system, which has three times the amount of capacity um, of that old sand filtration system. So this project will do that uh, the other two filters as well. Right now we need all three filters in order to meet our peak flow uh, capacity of the plant pass through the water into the with treatment through the filters. Um, if we were to take one down right now, we'd have to bypass part of that flow around this filtration system. In doing so, in retrofitting these filters, we're able to take them out 
service for any maintenance that needs to be done anytime and not have to worry about busting our peak flow um, at the plant. But this does not change that overall permit capacity, this changes filtration system capacity. West station number one gravity main bypass and decommissioning. This is actually is a project that ties into that um, other project, the South Shore one. Uh, so they're kind of all connected in a way. But list station number one, which you see at the far right hand side of the map, it's our oldest list station in the system, built in 1975. Also, you have the associated force main, which is a pressurized sewer line, that purple line you see going south. They're in the deteriorated condition, particularly the force main, um, very heavily corroded. And to replace that force main going under Woodlands Parkway and continuing to the south would cost roughly $2 million. And if you do that, you're still having to maintain that old list station, which, you know, in the near term future for rehab costs would probably be about $900,000. So the alternate is to redivert the flow to a 42 inch line, which was built in the uh, early 2000s on Lakefront Circle and Willis Parkway. And the cost and to do that is one and a half million dollars. So you can see already immediate cost savings to and replacement comparisons, and you get rid of the lift station and all that future. O&M and renewal costs. Water plant generators, also been in the project plan before. It's in the final design phase. Currently at three of our water plants. Now these are the groundwater plants, you know, for drinking water. Um, for backup power, we have these what we call auxiliary engines. So you can see at the top um, example of one that power a booster pump or a water well at those facilities. However, if you have a power outage, an operator has to physically drive to that facility, turn on that engine and engage it into whatever it's supposed to be powering. Um, they're also 30 to 40 years old, parts are getting very hard to come by, so it could be down for an extended period of time and that creates a, a bad situation. So replacing all that with generators to power most of the plant, you get that automatic backup power when there is an outage and you are not tied directly to any single pump or motor or well, you can direct the power where it's needed at the time of the, you know, when the outage occurs. Water well rehabilitation projects. This is actually a series of projects resulting from a master plan. It's not just one project, even though there is one underway right now. Um, so I've probably been told the surface water from the PRP plant is a supplementary source of water. And it could have a disruption. There's a possibility of that always occurring. So the Woodlands the Division keeps its wells in full operation to provide a full amount of water needed at the Woodlands. Uh, this program rehabilitates the wells as outlaid in a master plan, scheduling them from the you know the oldest, you know, the oldest uh, last rehab, so you know, 20 years you know, ago, or based upon what kind of production capacity that well can produce and how important it is in the system. Um, at the same time, we did modeling on the aquifers and based upon the, the, the decline rate that we're seeing in the future possibly from those models, if a well comes up for rehabilitation, if that well shows a decline, we will lower the pump further into the aquifer so that we have that 20 or 30 year more life expectancy of the, not only the well equipment, but the amount of uh, submergence it has into the aquifer. Water, and this is the last one to mention, the new water reclamation facility or wastewater plant number one. Um, as you all are aware, they had the strategic plan phases one and two, had the stakeholders group. And from the stakeholders group, a decision was made to move forward with a new water reclamation facility, a new MBR facility, a memory facility. However, to move forward any further, we have to have approval from the MUDs to be able to fund at least the preliminary and final design phase <coughs> project. Which y'all have probably been told many times before, the current facility does not meet TCQ design criteria. And lastly, we're able to start with the land acquisition process, uh, even though we can't fund the design right now. Um, I want to turn it over to Dan for a few slides here. He's going to talk about some scheduling and the project and the results of that. All right. How's everybody doing? So, a couple of quick slides I want to go through. Um, 
you know, just kind of the high level recap is we've, we've been at this project for two and a half, three years now, you know, going through the various phases of planning um, to get to where we are today. You know, that that's something that is, is typical of a, a project of this magnitude to go through that level of planning. Um, along the way, we've had certain major milestones and decisions that we've had to bring in the stakeholders and, and the MUD directors into to be able to proceed and you know, from phase one into phase two, um, selecting treatment uh, types, conventional versus the, the membranes, um, selecting which alternative to move forward with. So throughout that, you know, we've, we've kind of shown a, a generalized schedule. Um, also back in December at the end of phase two, you know, we showed basically the schedule that's up here today to what we were working towards was transitioning from the phase two, the master planning piece, into uh, further engineering design phases um, in April of 2024. So we are basically at that uh, critical point of being able to transition to the next phase. And the major aspect that needs to occur is agreements with all the MUDs um, on a, essentially a supplemental agreement to move forward with bond financing um, on the SRA to be able to finance it on the MUDs behalf. So there is an agreement there that is with the individual MUDs. That's not a majority vote with the trustees. Um, you may recall back uh, earlier this year, January, February timeframe, we presented a draft supplemental mm -hmm. agreement to y'all. Um, in that draft, you know, we were not asking for the full amount. You know, this is something that we would attack in separate tranches and bond releases over time. Um, so that initial amount was a, the a $40 million request to move forward and keep this project progressing um, into the design phases. So the schedule up here, you know, you'll see multiple milestones throughout, but what uh, the proposed schedule shows is being able to move forward um, in the coming months here with uh, commencing the procurement of a designer um, for this facility. Skipping through to the far right side of the graph, um, and the timeline here, fall of 2030 is the current anticipated completion of construction startup of a new facility. You know, one takeaway from this is, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. This is a, like a six year endeavor to go through design and the actual construction of a facility of this size. Um, so the second slide here, same milestones, except there's a shift in the schedule. Um, you know, this is something to try to hypothetically portray if there was a delay on starting the design. So in this case, we're showing a delay till December of 2025. Um, if that occurs, it's essentially going to push out the construction the same amount, year and a half, two years, um, till approximately a summer 2032 completion. But what are the impacts of this? Um, that that's something that we've been asked, something that we're still continuing to try to fully quantify. But in the sense of a, there's already projects that have been postponed um, as we went through this master planning. You know, we're trying to minimize any essentially sunk costs and investments into the existing facility if the plan is to completely replace it. So there's you know multi-million dollar projects and capital improvements that we put on hold knowing that a new facility is coming. So the further out we push this, there is going to be a more of an increased risk on the operational of this um, uh, aging equipment at the facility to maintain the desired level of service that the MUDs in the community um, have put on the, you know, the river floor. So next slide here, a lot of words <laughs> and a lot of items. Um, but what we've started to do is, all right, if there's a delay in getting the new facility started up, what items may we have to repair, rehab, replace just to maintain the operations and the desired level of service of the plant? So the column on the left are items that we've identified that would most likely need to be addressed in some manner if the construction is completed beyond that 2030 timeframe. So if we are delayed beyond what is proposed currently, which is at April 2024, starting procurement of a designer. These are the items that are on our mind that we feel are at risk of needing um, to be addressed after, you know, during that time period before a new plan is up and running. Column on the right, 
is if there's further delays, say beyond a uh, construction completion of 2033, here's a list of other assets at the facility that we feel are going to be at risk and need to be addressed. And in addition to that first column. So we've presented this to the audit committee. We've presented this to trustees, presenting this to all the MUDs. You know, one question that we have received um, and, and have heard that question and are working to try to provide some answers is, all right, can you quantify this into dollars? Of you know what is the cost of these items that you know we might be on the hook for if the plant's further delayed. So that's something in order for us to build the confidence in providing a, a, a accurate, the best of our ability cost estimate. We want to engage a consultant. So we're currently working with a consultant on what would they take as an approach to do that, um, and how much would that cost. And under in standard protocol of the MUDs. If there's an additional cost beyond our budget, beyond the original scope, we would be taking that request back to the trustees for approval. Um, so that's where we're at currently is working on what would it look like to try to bring back a quantified um, with a level of confidence cost estimates for these items. Um, something else that's not up on here that I think it is also uh, Something that needs to be considered is the further delayed the construction of the new facility is, you're also going to be in fighting inflation on the capital expenditures needed to build that new facility, which is not something that's quantified or even shown on this slide here. So really, we just wanted to kind of bring to your attention that we feel there is risks, both on the operation side, and then there's going to be cost impacts if it's further delayed on uh, the new water reclamation facility to where really our current as ask is can we find a way to keep progressing on at least the design phases at this point in time. Um, so I'll pause there with any questions. Uh, I'll go ahead now. Um, I, I understand the need to get a, a reasonable cost range for these things. However, it seems to me uh, there's also another way to look at it, and that is the criticality of individual items that you've listed here. So is there anything here? I mean, could you uh, like create a seriatim from most critical to least critical of these uh, identified projects? So what is, if something's not done, Mm -hmm. there the risk of the entire plant going down and having some kind of unmitigated disaster. Chris, I think this might have been something that came up last night to <laughs> another meeting of, of can we quantify risk in some yeah. way too. So right. I don't know if you want to speak on that. Everything that's on there is critical with what impact the permit or the actual ability to process items with the exception of the replacing of the stormwater corrugated metal pipes. So you're saying anything except for the rain, the storm pipes, correct? Could because cause an, a major issue with the wastewater treatment plant. Right. You take headworks, the first bullet, the second bullet, the third bullet, the fourth bullet. That's all getting wastewater into the plant. Right. So if any of those concrete structures fail or the plums fail, you cannot pull the wastewater from the collection system to put it into the plant. And and you start looking at the basin walls. If every basin, basin three goes down, we already have one and two that's out of service. So you take another one out of service. I've only got one basin left to handle 25% of the flow. Yeah. Now, you, we could reorganize and say this is most critical, but at the end of the day, these are the critical items. There's other stuff that has to be fixed, but mm -hmm. it's not nearly as critical mm -hmm. and doesn't impact the process. So there'd be some kind of monitoring plan. You'd be the operators will be looking very carefully at each of the items on right. a daily basis. It's the same thing that we do currently. Yeah, we just we know within the next five to seven years, something has to be done, which is why they were on project plans two, three years ago, but okay. we pulled them off with the new plant. Okay. But regardless, if we could stick on the same schedule or an adjusted schedule, we're still watching them every day. OK, so. I'm going to pass it back to Aaron to run through a couple of final slides here. On Some button turning tables here. So the projects that are, like I said, either ongoing and continuing the 25 or starting in 25, we have 
have a synopsis of those on uh, these two tables, the ones that are R&R &R funded. And then also ones that we, we have remaining bond funds from a 2017 bond um, that we're able to utilize them for these three projects at the bottom, uh, mounting up to well over $21 million. So that's, um, you know, bonds we already have in place. So, um, and now we're having to go talk about new bonds that are required in one. Of course, we talk about start the water reclamation facility and other projects. So those are the big ticket items. You see a little under $600 million total over that 10 year period. Um, but like I mentioned, it includes the new water reclamation facility, a conveyance optimization project, uh, some gravity main rehabilitations that have been in the project plan for quite a while now, uh, water line replacement projects, new ground storage tank that water plant two to replace the existing one, and a new water well. All in all done for the 10 year project plan, the entire binder in front of you, uh, you're looking at $87 million worth of RR funded projects. Uh, again, those 2017 bond funded projects, $21 million. And then the projects that we have on the project plan, but have no funding as of yet, a uh, little under $600 million for a total of a little over $700 million. With that, I'll um, open up to any, any questions. If not, um, we'll be through it and uh, if you have any other questions in the you know, next weeks um you can direct them to eric and he'll give it to us thank you thank you all so much this is three twelve one for two. So, so yeah, that's a good question. What's Can I ask it as our trustee? Uh, what's holding what's up the holding up the approval? What approval? Oh, approval report. Sorry. You talking about the supplemental agreement? Yep. So that, we have it. Right. It's been presented to the boards, but has not. We have not taken a vote on it uh, yet. Uh, if the board is ready to do that, we can put it on the next month agenda. Consider that. This is for the $40 million piece, and we'll talk some more about funding options here in the next agenda. Yeah, okay. Buy in. Yeah, okay. In order, to, discussion for yeah. in order to have a discussion about just, okay, if, if all these items need to be done in the 10 year period, what's pushing some items off, uh, such as the the uh, AC pipes, if this study comes back and says it has more use to life, then you can push that off. Or if the design of the plant comes in and somehow the costs get whittled down, um, and the number ends up being less than mm -hmm. 600 million that you need to bond finance, 90 something, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to pay for that? Uh, and thought it was important to mm -hmm. at least bring you some options for how that would all be funded before we took the first step of the first supplemental agreement. So that's what the purpose of uh, the next item on the agenda is. Well, let's move into that onion. <laughs> so in light of that, and in light of the questions that I was receiving from directors on what is this, how does this big number translate to the customers? Uh, we thought it'd be important to come up with some options on how that, how you might go about that, how the MUDs might go about that. So uh, Brian, Adam, myself, Maureen, we've worked on some different scenarios here, and I wanted to go through those with you. I just passed out a summary that uh, identifies four options and I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to read everything, but what I wanted to do is go over the highlights of each option and then you can kind of go through the pros and cons. No decision to be made today, more of just an introduction to these ideas and, and understanding what these options might be as we go forward. So option number one would be to have Esther A sell a a bond issue that they would then identify what the also a water rate would be required to cover the debt on that those bonds and then that they would uh, pass that on to Williams water and then we would pass that through on the water and sewer bills to do the and again these these numbers would be on the 591 the the unfunded piece of that mm -hmm. 700 um and so uh, that would, af after it's all said and done in, in 10 years, and of course it would 
probably ramp up to that point. Uh, the potential water bill would be about 250 bucks or so at when it's all said and done. So right now the, the typical water bill is about $104 across the woodlands. So it would go up to about 250 or so. That's a monthly monthly number. That's retail, right? It's the overall retail, right? With the wholesale pass through. Mm -hmm. Option two would be a rollback tax election. Talked a little bit about this at previous meetings. Essentially, the idea of this would be that you would go back to your voters and ask for authorization to adjust your existing MO tax rate to whatever number is necessary to cover your, uh, your the, this district's share of that debt. So to show the result of that one, you have this fold out a uh, little bit larger. And you go to your own settings on the first page, excuse me, about six. Um, as you can see, there's a, a red box there that identifies essentially what the high mark would be. It shows what the additional tax rate over and above what your current tax rate would need to be. So that's 0.24 cents at the highest that it would have to go up to. Uh, or, or be added on to where you're at today. And that would have an equivalent of about $1,069 for the typical home average. And so you can do the math that that's roughly 80 some odd dollars a month is what that would end up coming to. And the 1069 is an annual, it's the annual tax expert all for that. Anything to add there? Uh, no, I mean, you, you covered it. Um... It is based on the average homestead. Uh, and then just to give you a little bit of background on how we calculated it, we used the sixth and final accounting uh, for the connection. And we used the water and wastewater uh, to get a pro rata share for each district based on those connections. And so that's, if you look towards the top, uh, your district is around 6.54% of the connections uh, in the, the woodland system. Uh, so from that point, we backed into uh, what it would cost to to cover those expenses, the outstanding principal and interest over the eight or nine bond issues that the SGRA would potentially sell to cover the, the 592 million. So option three would be more going back to the water bill situation, but in this case, instead of running it off of water usage, uh, the idea would be to put in a flat fee, a uh, uh, infrastructure renewal fee. Uh, for the purposes of, of this exercise, we used 100, 200, 100 for residential, 200 for commercial. As you can see across the MUDs, that would create about $43 million a year. So over 10 years, you're, you're not quite there at, mm -hmm. nine, at 591. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that could be adjusted. Um, to, it, it has needed, but this also gives may give the opportunity for some of us to buy down some debt without even selling the bonds potentially. Option four, we really didn't develop fully because it is uh, cost prohibitive and it's probably uh, so far fetched that it's uh, just not worth it. And we probably could uh, give you more information on it, but we felt like it might be a waste of of uh, effort. What that would be is that you go back to your voters for bond authorization, giving you the authority to sell your own bonds. Um, and you know, we've been talking in, in this analysis contemplates about eight bond app, bond issues with uh, uh, SGRA. Option four would be eight per district. So that's 80 uh, going through the TCQ. So yeah. You can imagine the additional issuance costs, soft costs, uh, and all the financing. Not all the MUDs are on the same plane as far as uh, their uh, their bond rating. So there's going to be some variations in that. So that's that's a little bit problematic. It's it's how the district was uh, the woodlands was developed uh, based on tax bonds, but um, it's, it's not the not. I don't think it's the best choice to go with at this point. So those are the three different options. As you can see, there's different pros and cons. Something that I think we looked at on some of the pros and cons is what does it do to 
when we when we call kind of the the baseline user or the lifeline, you know, someone on fixed income that uses low water, uh, that you know, putting a certain water bill on them, what does that look like? Um, so, you know, there's some protections for that type of individual on the tax side that aren't on the water bill side necessarily. So, different things to think about. I guess what we would ask is that you kind of go through this a little deeper if you'd like, send some any questions that you might have to us, and we'll be happy to answer them. Maybe incorporate them if you've got different pros and cons you can think of. Be happy to adjust. I had a question. What is the assumption of property values over this time period? That they stay flat. They stay flat. Mm -hmm. So often, well, often when doing a performa like that, you, you can speak to it is is that you TCQ in some cases requires that we do a no growth performa. Okay, uh, I, that's where I was. Not assuming that the plans you're going to make. Are based off of those growths mm -hmm. of appreciation, mm -hmm. yeah, or or growth in in just tax base, uh, which there's not a lot of that necessarily. But you'd, I think there's there's some protections in place from from the state that says you shouldn't assume that those things are going to happen. Okay. So ultimately, you you would still every year when we set the tax rate, you would consider the new certified value. Mm -hmm. So you're you're essentially looking at in a perfect vacuum right now, what what would the impact be? So any additional growth would help offset that increase, obviously. And so year over year, you'd have that option to consider, uh, you know, ideally the discussion would be, if you do go to a rollback election, you would go to the highest initial amount, anything mm -hmm. over and above what you need, uh, you could do as you see fit, put it into a reserve fund, put it, set it aside to offset future bonds when SRA calls uh, for the next tranche, uh, but it gives you options. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately any appreciation uh, or value creep that you get to realize, you would help offset that number over time. And the reality is it's, it's going to operate like you have for 50 years, which is you had an initial tax rate. And as appraisals went up, you were able to lower that tax rate and you know manage it that way. And even though that's not how this is developed as far as no growth, Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that, or the likelihood is, is that that's probably going to be the case, as long as the woodland stays vibrant and, you know, is in good shape, the property values are going to be, you know, at least fairly safe, mm -hmm. we would think. Oh. So any potential impacts on the Senate bill constraints on well, tax rates and yeah, the that's, amount of tax collected? That's, that's what Eric and, and Adam are speaking to. So the... The game plan would be if you said, okay, I want to go with option two, we would call an election probably for next November, uh, where the district would say, okay, we'll let in a maintenance tax of um, this 2407 plus your current 07 and change, which is going to be over the three and a half percent, which oh, yeah. makes you have to have the rollback election. Correct. And so that's so we would have that election in November. You would only want to go through that process once. So you would go to the highest point on this scale, which mm -hmm. is the 2047 yeah. plus your current rate. Right. And if we obtain voter approval from that, uh, then that would be your new reset maintenance tax rate that next year, the following year, it would be three and a half percent off of well, that, that new rate. Right. So if, right. if appraisals went up 10%, mm -hmm. then you would bring that rate down to get you back to three and a half. Right. But you would have a new starting point. The, the okay. purpose of the rollback election is it gives you a new higher starting point yeah. that the following years are based upon. Thanks, Brian. Yep. In those early years, you might consider, like Adam said, you might consider uh, looking at your reserves, getting those a little bit more healthy in those first few years and, and growing some of that surplus to potentially buy down some some future debt and have a little bit more in reserve for those rainy day and some of the WWA uh, improvements that you're going to need that you're going to be facing over the years as well on the line work stuff. Mm -hmm. I presume there's still quite a bit of diversity throughout the MUDs mm -hmm. on reserves. On reserves, uh, for the most part, I'd say most of them are lower than where I'd like them to be. There's a couple that are in better shape and some that are in worse shape, but I'd say all of them in general probably need to be a little bit better. 
at this point. There's there's a few at six, a few in, in the three months, a few in the three. I think there is one at 13 or 12 or 13 maybe. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to, in this environment where we have the aging infrastructure, we know we're going to have more breaks. We know we're going to have to deal with more stuff in the coming decades. Uh, you would rather, when you're going, when things are newer and you're not really dealing with that stuff, it, it probably makes sense to, to not have as big a reserve, but that's not where we are. We're moving into more of an aged situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having a more, something more like a 12 month or something like that reserve would make a little bit better sense than where some of the months are right now. Okay. So of the three viable options, shall we say, um, do all the MUDs need to have a similar approach to uh, funding these potential? Uh, what what I would say is off. all the MUDs have to independently vote on it. Right. So it's not one for all. Um, ideally, there's consistency in the direction that everyone goes. Uh, there are some advantages certainly to that as well. One of the things that We've talked about Jim managed for a long time, and that I think is important that that we try to keep rates relatively consistent across all the muds. I think that makes sense. Right now, you have eight muds that with one rate, uh, particular rate, and two that are different, and those two are different from each other. So you have essentially three sets of rates across the ten muds. Ideally, if you went the tax tax route, you could probably utilize that to to balance that back out, uh, that that would be a decision for each mud on how they want to do that. But yeah. it would make sense, but yeah, I, I, if it doesn't, then you know you might have some districts that decide to do it on the tax side and others that don't mind that size water bill, I suppose. Mm. But I'm not sure that's maybe advisable, but. So what efforts need to be made? made to uh, have some kind of alignment because it seems to me that that is where well, the push needs to be. I have a huge study about the yeah. a huge task is going to be education. Uh, we are starting that process with uh, with the PR firm and, and partnering with SDI right now uh, to start building that campaign just to educate the public on the aging infrastructure, the dollars we're talking about, the options that are here before them. Uh, as Brian said, you know, a month or so ago, Brian had mentioned that a rollback tax election would need to happen at a November mm -hmm. uh, election. And so I think we feel like this November would be a little bit quick to be able to educate the public to the level ready to make that decision. Oh, right. Then you're done in the whole $40 million project, aren't you? Well, well, so. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the question that's before you at this point. Making a decision if the MUDs chose to to go down that path to keep that project moving wouldn't necessarily prevent you from being able to go back to the voters. It would carve off a piece of the 591, so these numbers would go down a little bit um, long term. You know, you, mm -hmm. you would carve off a chunk, but it wouldn't. Um, it wouldn't force you to continue down that path for those that chose not to. He said that they can include their draft supplemental uh, has a clear provision uh, to have the bond for the two years of capitalized interest, which would be interest in the bonds that would be used to pay the debt service for the interest portion for the first two year period. And so you would have some breathing room before you need to make a decision on whether you would be putting the 40 million into your rates or if you had a, decided to go with the rollback election, if you were able to have that successful rollback election next year, and then maybe not put any of that first 40 million in your rates, you would have it all um, in your in your taxes. But um, but that there is some, some flexibility there to be able to approve a supplemental this first piece to not start the delay uh, issues, but then move toward a goal of, okay, we'd like to get voter approval for a rollback rate. If we can't, then we'll have to go with option one or three. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you can, you know, uh, 
uh, educate the public that, look, your 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 piece of this for an average resident is going to be $1,069 under this option, where if it's in your rates, it's going to be, if you're an average user, $1,752. That's pretty, you know, uh, pretty easy math there. Right. Uh, but it does have to get over. Hey. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're up again. Attorney's report. Right. Uh, nothing of a general nature. We don't have a separate agenda. Okay. And then uh, consider and act upon the updated drought contingency plan and water, water conservation policy and authorize adoption of a resolution regarding the yield stand. We are still working with the consultant and the river authority on those two plans. So that will be deferred today and will be taken up for action next month. Okay. Consider adoption of a resolution concerning the developed district status for the 2024 year tax year. Yep, that's in your packet. As you were last year, you continue to be a developed district and subject, as we were talking earlier, to the three and a half percent rollback rate when we adopt our 2024 tax rate in August, September, October of this year. You need a motion on that resolution. Can I have a motion? Uh, I'd like to move. Do I have a second? Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. General manager's report. All right. A couple of quick updates. Um, Neil and I attended the Gulf Coast Water Conservation Symposium a few weeks ago. It was an enlightening uh, day of information from folks across the state mm -hmm. on what they're doing. I thought it was very educational. I attended the George's Coffee Club on Monday and myself, Ed Shackelford, and Aubrey Spear presented to the group. A uh, summary of essentially what WWA does, what the MUD's responsibilities are, what SDRA's responsibilities are uh, for the woodlands. And then we talked a little bit about the uh, the infrastructure projects and didn't get as in detail as in the funding options, but talked a little bit about that. Uh, it seemed like it was well received. So uh, probably be more opportunities to to be speaking to the public on on that. Uh, sure. How large is Georgia's Bucket Club? Yeah, really. Uh, it's about <clears throat> 75 okay, uh, really? plus guests. If I, I mean, some people can be guests, I guess. It's about 70 to 80 people in the room. Wow. Like yeah, that. That and movers and shakers, or at least previously movers and shakers. Yeah. Still, mm -hmm. still it is. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I uh, wanted to uh, announce that. Uh, WWA has won an, an award for from AWWA and WEAT, uh, Water Ed, uh, Environment Association of Texas. Uh, it's the Watermark Award for Communications Excellence. So we applied uh, last year for that. Uh, we'll be honored at the their April conference. Uh, the award was for our efforts in the 2020 for the 2023 um, strategic communication plan that was developed out of the PEC. So um, very excited to uh, be right. receiving that. It's been a lot of hard work. And uh, John, take it away. <laughs> uh, all credit to the PEC on that and your Dr. Gaynor's guidance and <laughs> shaping a, an excellent. <laughs> all right, uh, your communications report is on page 48. The first thing I wanted to touch on uh, just returns on your annual update to, the, to your, uh, your customers that went in last month. Um, so we sent that out digitally and um, via email, social media, and then, uh, stuffed it in the mail at the uh, water bill. Um, so you have 79% of your accounts are on our email list, our constant contact list. Number one for the MUDs, by the way. Good job. And then about 72% uh, get a hard copy bill. So it's good that you're you're sending that out multiple ways mm -hmm. um, to try to catch as many folks as you can. And we saw a um, a nice spike uh, in your web page visitation in the two weeks following um, those send outs. Um, about a 20% increase in web page visitation. So. so I think that was effective. Uh, wanted to note some activity on WaterSmart. Always a critical tool for us, our primary customer support tool. Always working to get those registrations up. We're right about 40% right now. Our monthly rate of registration 
uh, for 2023 was 170 a month. We're at 333 a month to date this year. Nearly double. The, the fact that we now have auto pay through Water Smart is really driving that. Mm -hmm. Continue to see more and for, more and more folks go to Water Smart. In fact, 100% will be paying auto paying through Water Smart by the end of the year. So um, that's great. We got them, and now we just got to maximize that tool. For them. Uh, some examples of current marketing materials on the next two pages. Uh, do note the outreach calendar on page 50. As always, we would love to have directors out uh, at our community events. You know, we've got a booth and we're interacting with the public. You're always welcome to, to join us uh, for a minute or an hour. Um, that emergency preparedness event on April 13th at Town Hall, that's a township event. That's a good one. Well attended. Uh, folks are coming for information. So if you want to come on out and meet with folks, uh, April 13th, Saturday at Town Hall. <clears throat> and then lastly, we are, you have the option to stuff this month's water bill going out in 10 days uh, with a one third page um, uh, notice regarding the elections. And this is a very simple information only, of course, non advocacy piece that is simply noting the dates uh, and locations uh, where, where folks can vote early and day of, and then um, a list of candidates. So, and some QRs where they can get more information, just pushing them to your mud page. So you're looking at about 150 bucks if you want to add that to this month's water bill. It's well worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. Good for it. Okay, we'll proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Our attorney left, so I'm not sure, but how about the trustees report? Okay, well, we are on page 46 of the packet. Um, the key thing from at least my viewpoint uh, from the uh, trustee meeting was the vote on the excess funds. Uh, although it was brought as a single entity, I would have thought it would have been better, in my opinion, to have each one looked at, each element looked at individually. But so it wasn't a unanimous vote, but uh, it was a majority vote. So uh, the various projects um, that SGRA has proposed using the funds for will occur. Uh, and the accounting ledger change from one place to another will also occur. Um, so uh, that's in regard to the emergency reserve. And hopefully out of this discussion at the trustees, we might see some updates happen. We shall see. Um, the uh, just the other only other comment that uh, John has already spoken about, we're, we're working on making sure the branding uh, for the communications uh, is uh, unique and it'll be at a glance what we're about in terms of educating the public. So that's that's an important element. Uh, and any questions? Thank you. There any reason to? There's I just had one thing I, I missed earlier. Uh, I noticed in the, uh, sorry, about this, on page 41, that, that some individual mugs were impacted by the text dot um, realignment or modification on 242. That's in addition to what we were voted on for SJRA's work on realigning uh, some of the water mains. Uh, are there any other roads uh, around here that TxDOT has an interest in that could impact individual months? I mean, not at the moment. I'm not aware of any uh, pending projects, but okay. um, well, we could be impacted by a county project because yeah. we don't always get adequate notice to move our lines before they start <laughs> going to construct them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got that line issue on uh, Woodlands Parkway, don't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. It still needs resolution. Yeah, it's there, been, it's been sitting there for a long time. So you don't own any road right of ways. And yeah. So, uh, and a lot of utilities, uh, Woodlands utilities, are in road right of ways. 
<laughs> and not in dedicated easements. And so mm -hmm. where that occurs, if that entity, road entity, said, I'm I'm going to walk into or whatever, and we have facilities in that area, uh, they will often say, move your stuff. The only other ones I can think of around the woodlands is going to be 1488, this text off, 1488, 2978. You had to deal with some training stuff years ago with 2978. Okay. So everything else is pretty much county then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any agenda items for next month's meeting? All right. Meeting adjourned.